Hi, my name is John Williams, and welcome to John's Bible Study Channel. Did you know storms can come through obedience? That's true. We're going to get into the lesson today, but before we do, let's, uh, let's enter in prayer. Father God, we give you thanks and praise. We glorify you. We bless your name. Father, we thank you for your word, and I ask, Father, that you help me to deliver it with clarity, uh, with detailed information uh, that will bless your people. Uh, Holy Spirit, I ask you to anoint me afresh right now. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, how many times have we seen in Scripture that people were doing exactly, when I say people, the apostles, the prophets, uh, people of God, were doing exactly what they were told to do, and yet the storm still came in their lives? Quite a few times. It's no fun, but, but God, that's God's will for us, to mature us, to bless us even. And we're going to study a few instances in Scripture today about this topic. Amen? So if, if you like this uh, content, if you like my channel, if you like my teachings, would you kindly like, subscribe, and make a few comments in the comment section that will help my channel grow and we can get our messages out to more people. Amen? Thank you for that. So we begin, we begin our study uh, in the study of uh, Gen in the book of Genesis, verse twenty-one, uh, excuse me, chapter twenty-one, verses eleven to twenty-one. Okay, Genesis chapter twenty-one, verses eleven to twenty-one, and I begin in the NIV. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I'm just going to give you some context. As you know, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, uh, Abraham's name was changed from Abram to Abraham, and his wife's name, Sarai, was changed to Sarah. So Abram and Sarai became Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah did not have any children, and they were old in age, like 80s, approaching the 90s. And God promised Abraham a son that he will make into a great nation. At this point, uh, Abraham did not have children. So Sarah decided to allow Abraham to sleep with her maiden, to mate with her maiden, to get a son. And he did. So clearly God was already working into working in his body at 90, what, five or so? That's pretty old. And he produced a son through her handmaiden. Her name was Hagar. So Sarah conceived a son as well in her old age. And as the boy was weaned, right, Ishmael, uh, uh, Isaac, the promised son, was weaned. Hagar's son was already about, I don't know, six or seven years old. Uh, and, no, it was probably older than that. Anyway, uh, he was probably in his teens, just early teens, maybe 12, 13. And uh, Sarah didn't want anything to do with Ishmael even though it was her idea. So Abraham's, you know, he's, he's concerned now because Sarah's asking him to do away with Hagar and Ishmael, who was also Abraham's son. So now we pick it up in verse 11 to 21. Verse 11, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is, it is through Isaac, right, the promised son, that your offspring will be reckoned. 
Verse 13, I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. Okay, so let's stop right there. Bar none, Sarah's handmaiden or slave or, or however you choose to call her, she worked for Sarah. Uh, normally, when, when handmaidens had slave girls, they were usually the most prettiest out of all the slaves because they're working directly with the family, and they're very obedient. They'll, they'll do literally whatever they tell them to do within reason. Well, in this case, uh, it wasn't uncommon back then for uh, handmaidens to, to be given to even visiting guests to entertain or accommodate them. Well, Sarah asked her to go to her own husband and to try to make a child, which they did. How, how do you think she felt? Now, if, if she was ever to, to get married, that's not possible in that culture at that time. Most slaves, I mean, slaves could marry, sure. But now that she had a child with another man, her, the options for her to be married are, were very, very slim. It's not like today, right? So she knew once that happened, then she was basically uh, going to be a single woman from that point on. So she knew this. Not her fault, right? But that fell upon her. So here she is now doing what she, what she was told to do, and now they're sending her and, and her son away. So we pick it up now in verse 14. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them upon her shoulders and sent her off with the boy. So they went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. Stop right there for a moment. <clears throat> Abraham, by this time, he had over 300 men. Uh, and as we see in later on in Scripture, it was those 300 that rescued his nephew from, uh, from being abducted by kings. So those 300 men likely had wives and children and daughters and maidens and such. Abraham, Sarah and Abraham could have selected anyone they wanted to send her off. But do you notice... Abraham himself sends her off. There, there, there's a certain amount of care. Why? Because it says right here, uh, and he set the skin of water and food on her shoulder. So he had, he had an affection for her. Why? Because she's the mother of his child. Come on. You know, and, and he's, he was sad to see them go. Not just the boy, but her too. You can tell. He set them upon their shoulder. And I'm, and I'm sure he probably just stood there as they walked and disappeared over the horizon into the desert. Back then, if you went into the desert unprepared, death was certain. No one was coming to rescue you. You were going to die out there. And Abraham uh, likely knew this as well. So he sets them off, and they wandered in the desert of Beersheba. How sad, right? And, and again, she was simply doing what she was told to do. Verse 15, when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Uh, 16, then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And she sat there and began to sob. A bow shot in those days was about probably about 100 yards, about the length of a football field. Pretty far. Um, I mean, you can see, she can still see him clearly, uh, but she, she didn't want to see him die because she knew, again, you, you go out into the desert unprepared, no water, no food, uh, and for days, your, your fate is certain. So we pick it up on, on verse 17. God heard, God heard 
the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying, and he lies as he lies there. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. So, what 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 difference? I mean, what, why does why does God cry out to him as opposed to any any other person who would be dying in the desert? Well, we already read that God declared He would make a nation of Isaac, the, the son of promise, and uh, Ishmael as well. He was going to make a nation of them both. So when the boy cries, right, Ishmael now becomes a son of promise as well, a promise that he would be a nation. So there's no way God can now allow him to die in the desert. Right? That would go against what he already declared, right? So we begin, we pick this up in verse, uh, in verse 17. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Verse 18. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand. For I will make him into a great nation. God is a God of covenant. He remembered what he said. He stands over his word. He watches over his word to perform it. To this day, whatever God has promised you, whatever God, whatever dream God gave you, whatever words through a prophet God has said to you, he has not forgotten. He remembers what he said. And he is faithful and righteous to perform exactly what he said. I'm sorry that 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 that's, that that one is additional to the lesson, but it, that that's good right there. Amen. So, verse 19. Then God opened her eyes. Right. He opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water, and gave the boy to drink. God was with the boy, verse 20, as he grew up and he lived in the desert and became an archer. Isn't that interesting? She walked, what? A, a, a bow's throw away. It, it said that. A bow shot away. I'm looking for it. Uh, and he said, I don't know if it, about a bow shot away. That's what the word says. And here it is, a mother who walked off a bow shot away, now raises a son who becomes what? An archer. Archers back then was a big deal. Uh, people were afraid of archers. Why? Because they can kill you from afar. And usually they practice for almost a lifetime to be accurate, not only with one, but many bows, right? With many arrows at the same time. And he, be, and he says he was skilled. Amen. Uh, verse 21, while he was living, uh, we're talking about Ishmael, while he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife f for him from Egypt. So, we see that although Hagar, the Bible calls her, a handmaid, the Bible calls her a slave, and she was simply doing what she was asked and commanded to do yet not only does God bless her by by speak by giving her a son and a male son at that males of her were 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 dominant they, they were sought the most sought after child that you can have I mean not that girls aren't on a blessing uh, women are a blessing of course they are but of course you always want the firstborn to be a son which uh, Ishmael was but not only did he bless her with a son he blessed her with a son that will become a nation, and God spoke to her, and it's clearly recorded in Scripture. Amen? How many women can say that? Not many. Amen? So, here's one example of how 
Storms can come through obedience. But in the end, she was blessed. Amen. We, we uh, continue on with this with Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene, John. Simon of Cyrene. Here's another story where uh, the storm came to Simon. And because of it, he, we know who his name is. We know who he is to this day. Let's, let's begin with the lesson. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Jesus was being crucified. He was whipped, beaten with the cat of nine tails, scourged. He was bloody. He looked probably like un, of any person that they've ever seen in that day except for those who were tortured by the Romans, which he was also tortured by the Romans. He's walking uh, the Via Della Rosa to the cross uh, uh, on Golgotha, right? To where he's going to be crucified. And that's where they did it. Well, uh, Simon of Cyrene was coming home from the country with his two sons. Let's pick this up. And uh, that was Matthew Let's pick this up in Mark chapter 15, verse 21, NIV, and it reads, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him, they being the Romans, forced him to carry the cross. The, trans, the Passion Translation says it this way, as they came out of the city, they stopped an African man named Simon, a native of Libya. He was passing by, just coming in from the countryside with his two sons, Alexander and Rufus. And the soldiers forced him to carry the heavy cross beam for Jesus. Luke 23, verse 26, chapter 23 Verse 26 says, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. The only reason why we know who Simon of Cyrene is, is because the storm came to him. And not only do we know who he is and where he's from, we know of his sons, Alexander and Rufus. He was canonized in scripture in history forever. And I'm sure uh, God watched over him to the day he died for carrying the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his sons. Amen. The scripture doesn't say that. I'm going to do some research and just, just confirm whatever happened to him. But isn't that amazing, right? Our God is a good God. Uh, my, final, uh, my final example is Stephen in the New Testament. We pick it up from Acts 7, chapter 7, verses 51 to 59. Long story short, um, Stephen was a disciple. He was an honorable man. He helped the, the widows and orphans. He fed them. He served in uh, the, the way or the Christians back in the day. And he was preaching and the uh, Sanhedrin, which was the high priest in the temple, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, also priests in the temple, did not like what he was saying. So they brought, them, they brought him to the temple to question him uh, and to find out what he's saying. So we pick it up in verse 51 of Acts chapter 7. And Stephen is uh, speaking, and this is what he says. You stiff-necked people. Uh, he's, he's fully aware of who he's talking to. But he has the boldness of a lion th through the spirit of Jesus Christ. And this and, and is written down for our 
edification to this day. That's how he starts. You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Where there ever, where there ever a prophet, excuse me, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, of course. And, and they, didn't, they knew exactly what happened to Jesus. They still didn't like him. Uh, and they thought that they won. So uh, for him to talk about Jesus in the temple before them was, was, was not a good thing as far as they were insulted and offended. For he continues, verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Right? And he's, he's seeing this. But he continues. This is what he says in verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. In Scripture, we always read Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. But in this passage, he is what? Standing in honor of the first martyr of the Christian movement, or the way, as they called it back in the day. He knew what was going to happen. Verse 57, at this they covered their ears. They the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. They covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. We know Saul this is the same Saul that was converted by our Lord and Savior himself who knocked him off his horse, who renamed him as Paul. That's right, Paul the, the Apostle was standing there when Stephen was being stoned. Verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Fell asleep. So, these three examples show you that even though the storm comes to you when you're being obedient, there is still a blessing of God that follows. Unfortunately for Stephen, it was to his death. Uh, for Hagar, it was the naming of her son as uh, the father of many nations. Right? For Simon of Cyrene, although it was a very morbid scene for him and his sons to see, he participated in the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, All right? The storm came to them for being obedient. What am I saying? Do not fear being obedient to whatever God tells you to do. Do not fear to say what he tells you to say. Do not fear doing what he tells you to do. For even those that came before us suffered in the same, same way, but they, held, they kept the faith. They did what God said. They honored him, and therefore God honored them in return. 
I pray that this uh, lesson has blessed you, that it has enlightened you, that you understand these three individuals more intimately uh, and more, and that you would share, uh, you would like, subscribe, comment even. Uh, if there's anything that I can improve upon, please let me know as well. Uh, and thank you for being a part of my Bible study channel today. Let's end this with prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise, we honor you, we glorify you, we love you, oh God. And Father God, I pray for all those in the sound of my voice who are being obedient, Father God, and they're still receiving the brunt and the effects of the storm today. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray that you give them a special anointing, Father, that you would be with them. Father God, that you would give them favor, that you would open doors of opportunity. Father God, that you would be with them, give them wisdom, dreams, vision, direction. Father God, may, may you make your presence tangible to them out of their obedience, Father. I pray and I give you thanks in advance for hearing this prayer, for I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for stopping by. And please uh, come back next time for John's Bible Study channel. God bless you.